Hello, and thanks for joining me again as I dive deeper into the world of Azure Synapse Analytics. Now, you guys know I'm a big fan of Spark. I do lots of Sparky things. Generally, that is my main area of interest. And yet, there's an area of Synapse Analytics Spark pools I've not dug into yet. And I was expecting in the comments to be hounded going, uh, have you not done anything about .NET? Why are you not talking about the fact you can now write C Sharp directly in a notebook on top of the Synapse Spark pools? And yeah, it's fair, it is fair. And yet no one's mentioned it. I don't get any questions about it. I don't get anyone asking, hey, what do you think of .NET for Spark? Um, and it's it's an interesting idea because it's really, really interesting if you're doing lots of .NET. If you're a .NET house and you need to throw something over the fence at Spark, then that is a fantastic thing to be able to do. However, a lot of the people that we speak to, they're either data people coming from a SQL background and they kind of gravitate towards Python, or they're already out in the Spark ecosystem. And so they're using Scala, Python, or R. So it's interesting in terms of that marketing of where is that for? Who is it, who is it for? Uh, is an interesting idea. But I have dug into it. I have brushed off my very dusty C-sharp skills. So let's go and have a quick look at how it works, how you start writing a C-sharp notebook, how it differs to a normal Python notebook, and one or two of the things that you might be able to do now that we can use C-sharp. So as usual, don't forget to like and subscribe. And let me know if there's any use cases, any things you're excited about, any questions as to why would I do this? Don't forget, comment down below, and we'll dig into it and see if we get some more future videos out of it. All right, so I have a notebook. I've taken the liberty of starting my Spark pool. I've got a session set up. I'm in Synapse Studio, and I have the most simple of simple hello world little variables living in Python. So this is a PySpark notebook currently. So I'll switch this over and say, I want to use .NET for Spark. And it is that easy. This is now entirely a C-sharp backed notebook. Now again, we've got magic commands, so I can switch out to C and Python and that kind of things. But for now, we can treat it as it was. So I can say, I want to create a new variable that's a string that's equal to hello, and then print it out. And this is going to tell me my least favorite error message. Oh, it needs a semicolon. Everything needs a semicolon. Except for world, weirdly, when I'm printing things out. Sorry, some things need a semicolon, some things don't. Uh, so there we go. So I can have a variable. It is C-sharp. It's expecting C-sharp syntax. And that's going to be the hardest thing to get used to. Remembering, oh, so that's going to be capitalized. That needs double quotes, not single quotes. That, that's going to need a semicolon. That's kind of the, the hardest thing to get used to when switching over to use .NET. It's just remembering those syntactical differences. So that's not exciting. We need to be able to build a data frame, right? So let's say I'm going to give it a string to be my lake path. And do I have, there we go. So I'm saying, I want to go and read that particular thing. <laughs> Mr. Semicolon again. There we go. Welcome to this video of Simon forgets how to write C sharp and doesn't put a semicolon anywhere. Okay, so happy with that. So I'm going to say I want a data frame. So there's a new data frame class. That is the thing I'm building. It's going to be called DF because, as usual, uh, and that's going to be Spark. So my Spark context is this lowercase Spark variable, but then the commands are all going to be. C-sharp syntax, and we're expecting the Pascal case for everything. So spark.read. So while it's normally right, kind of lowercase spark.read and no function, read is a function, so it needs it. And then I can do parking. Again, simplest of simple. That's defining a new data frame using the inbuilt Spark reader, pointing it at some Python, or some Python, pointing at some parquet, and then passing in that path string. So again, I should be able to read that. And again, it needs a semicolon. And then we can hopefully define our data frame and then do some stuff with it. Now, when that comes back, we're going to want to do a display. So we can display our data frame and what is that? Ah, okay, so that is just the fact that this one's relative um, path. So it needs to start with a slash so it knows it's going into a folder. It's a little bit weird. I'm pretty sure that's a different syntax than we've seen before. Okay, so there we go. So it's running a job. It's picking up my thing. So it's reading the parquet. That seems happy, and we're just going to kick off. There we go, succeeded. So we should be able to do that <laughs> every time. Uh, so we should be able to see our data frame and actually then start working with it as normal. So that's good. So basically, we can do normal data frame stuff, and there's nothing exciting there. Okay, great. I can have a data frame. Basically, I can do Spark things. 
So let's do some normal stuff. So I want to say my data frame. Again, now I can just refer to it as a variable name now that I've instantiated that variable. And that is data frame dot, let's do with column. Again, capital W, we're now using uh, C sharp font, uh, syntax. And I want to say, let's do the file name. And then, so I was trying, I was like, well, I'll just be input file name. I'm assuming just, it's just the same things, but uppercase if I need to. And that's not true. And I, was, I spent a little while digging around and going, what's that going to be? How am I going to, where do I find that? But that is not a valid function name. So luckily we do have a fair bit of documentation already. If you Google for the Microsoft.Spark.SQL library, they've actually a fairly good functional library already set up. So I was in here and I was like, what's it going to be? Is there an input? Input file name. Okay, so it's now, it's in here as input file name, all one word with Pascal case. Okay, fine, we can deal with that. So actually it's just a case of get rid of underscores. And again, that's, that's all the complexity is. It's just for the things that you're familiar with, digging around and going, so what, what's, the, what's the new syntax? Uh, and then hopefully you can just do a display on that data frame <laughs> with the semicolon. Um, and then we should be able to see what that looks like. So let's go. Okay. So that was happy and I don't get a file name, which is interesting. Now, I think that's because of caching. So essentially, input file name doesn't work if you've cached the data frame in between actually running that and when you get it back. And because the Spark service that we have inside uh, Sign Up Spark Pools is auto caching for us, then it just means we're divorced by some things that don't work if you've cached. So I think that's down to that. But even so, all of the normal functions are here. If I just restarted the session and ran it from scratch, we should see the file names in there. So. We can do normal Spark things. Let's just do something a little bit even more normal. Let's go my data frame is equal to my data frame dot select. Do select expression. And I just want to say uh, sales order ID, you're right. Yeah, so I'm gonna say sales order ID, sales order detail ID, and let's bring in product ID. And then we've got line total. So maybe just can I write a select statement? To see if that goes in. Yeah, so that successfully brought back a data frame. So I can just do a quick display on that data frame. Running out of space at the bottom. <laughs> so yeah, weirdly, you don't need a semicolon if it's a variable setting. You do need it if you're just running a functional command. So, but, and there we go. So I've got my select, I've got fewer columns coming back. Happy. So that, that all seems to make sense. I can do the usual stuff I would do. So let's say data frame dot create or replace temp view, and let's call this uh, sales. So I can take that data frame, I just need a semicolon. <laughs> <laughs> See, I didn't need a semicolon. Okay. Um, and I can do standard SQL. So I can switch it over into SQL context and go select star from sales. And that should go and work with it. So, Basically, it's, it's the Spark Data Frame API, except there's some syntactical differences. So nothing particularly crazy there. It's actually something, you know, fairly straightforward to work with. There we go. So we can see my data frame. It's got those changes. It's got just the columns I uh, expressed in my select statement. So yeah, fine, that is all good. So let's do something a little bit funkier. Why would I use C Sharp over using something like Python or Scala? And one of the main arguments that have been made is the difference in interop. So Spark is Java-based. Um, so if you're right, running something in Python, or you're running something in R, um, that, if you're doing a user-defined function, that can't run inside the JVM. So if I write a little transformation saying, for this column, pass it out to this function, do something with that, pass it back, then that doesn't perform very well. There, there's some issues in terms of how that um, sends data into, or well, outside of the JVM. Now, C Sharp, they've got a specialized interop. So if there's any cases where that does happen, they've actually sort of spent a lot of time actually making that a little bit more performant, a little bit more optimized. So there's some good things in there in terms of how that works. And especially, honestly, there's just a lot of C Sharp libraries out there. So if there's something that is very C Sharpy and you wanna actually just use that in the middle of your code, 
then it's a good excuse to do it. So let's see. Um, I'm going to pull in an example. So if I want to register this thing, a UDF, a user-defined function, then I've got this straightforward command. So this is the C sharp syntax version of it. So I'm saying I want in my Spark context to register a new UDF, and this is what I'm expecting it. So it's expecting a string input, it's giving a string output. Essentially, just you give it a list of arguments. The first ones will be the inputs, the last will be the output. Uh, give what should I call my UDF, and then give it some kind of a mapping lambda function kind of thing, saying this is how that's going to work. So I can register a new function and then just use that inside my select statement and actually just say this is how I want it to work. So let's grab, uh, do I have something C-sharpy knocking around? Yeah, this is the one I was using as an example. So if I've got this, so this is just an example. Did a quick Google going, how do I base64 encode a string? And then Stack Overflow, a little example, this is how you would do that. So taking that and saying, that is a straightforward bit of C-sharp style stuff, things people are doing quite a lot. How would I turn that into a UDF and how would I use it in my um, C-sharp context? So we're going to call this, uh, let's call it encode in base64. So I'm expecting a string. So this is going to be my kind of uh, input string. And then I need to give it some kind of function. So we're going to say, let's, we can just call these things. So first things first would be, I want to actually take that input string. And I want to get the bytes from it. Uh, and then that, when it does a return, so basically it's, make, it's turning that into a string by wrapping it, and then it's passing the result of that into another thing. So we can just do that straight away. So we can say, take the results of that and then wrap that entire thing. Another thing. Okay. So this thing is going to take in an input string, going to pass that to this little function. It's going to do the UTFA get bytes um, function around it. And it's going to pass that that byte array into this two base 64 string. And then I can then use that as an actual UDF. So let's just second register it. Have I missed some syntax somewhere? Oh, that seemed happy. Okay. Uh, I have cheated. I've got the, the vice versa. So we can say decode. I've got both sides. So essentially just that the other way around, but get string and from rather than two base and get bytes. So two little quick UDFs. Will it fail if I try and register the same UDF? See? No, that was happy. Okay. So that is saying there's a custom function that I want to define using C Sharp, using baked in .NET C Sharp libraries or libraries that I've pulled in onto the cluster. And then I can actually use that within my code. If I do a quick example, I should actually be able to use that in the SQL context now that I've registered my view. So I can say, so I can say select in code base 64. And I can pass something to it. So what do we have? We've got my sales order ID. And I bring back the straightforward order ID. Should be able to just run that. So that's now using that custom function inside just a select statement because I've registered it as a UDF. And that did not work. Okay, what did they like? They would cast. Okay, so I needed a. I told my UDF is expecting a string. Gave it an int and it got upset with me. Try that again. Okay. So you can see that has wrapped my function. I've now encoded it. I've taken what was an int, cast it to a string, encoded it, and let's try it's the true test, right? Can I decode? Whoops, what did I call that? Decode base 64 around that whole thing. Basically, turn it back into what it was. And then I should be able to test that it's the same thing that I've been able to encode it, pull it out, decode it. There we go. So actually that's working quite happily. And that's, that's the main argument that I've seen for using spark.net. Taking some existing C sharp libraries that you're happening to use elsewhere. Maybe there's a C sharp DLL that you use in an application for either encryption or for, I don't know, you've built something custom and you want to bake that into your spark jobs rather than have to take your data out of spark put it somewhere else, score everything, encrypt everything, do whatever you're doing in C-sharp, and then pull it back in. So you can now just take those straight libraries, build it into a UDF. However, that is still using an interrupt. 
That is still going from the JVM, going outside, doing something outside the JVM and bringing it back in. So it's never gonna perform quite as well as just pure data frame logic. Also, Scala is inside the JVM and can pass down to Java. So if you could write that as Scala, then that would also perform better than using doing it in C Sharp. So it tends to be, if you're a C Sharp house, if you have a ton of existing C Sharp uh, IP, knowledge, skills, capacity, whatever, then there's a lot of stuff you can bake in and you don't have to step outside the language, which is great. If you're currently just learning this stuff, would I recommend using .NET? Probably not. It's easier and quicker to get started with Python and it's more performant to get started with Scala if you're writing these UDFs. Now, obviously, all of this stuff does go through the Catalyst engine. If you're just doing pure data frame stuff, it makes zero difference to speed. It's only when we're talking about those user-defined functions or we're bringing in custom libraries that we're gonna see any kind of performance difference. So if you are currently a C-sharp person and you're like, well, that, 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 those demos all make sense to me, and by the way, learn how to put semicolons in, then maybe this is for you. Maybe this just makes entire sense and you should learn Spark just straight using .NET. There's other elements that could be used as an argument. You know, the testing frameworks for .NET are so much more mature. So if you're doing a real application uh, that needs to be very, very mature and go through real mocks and unit tests and part of your DevOps pipeline, you can do all that stuff with Python, but it's just, it's a little bit kind of just wrapped in. It's a little bit forced. Whereas a lot of that stuff for C Sharp is incredibly mature. So there are arguments as to if you're just starting out, why use it? Um, for me, certainly, I'm not gonna change. I write most of my stuff in Python and I find it way, way easier to teach people this is how Spark works from a Python perspective if they don't already have a strong base in any of those languages. So if you're coming straight from the SQL world and you wanna pick this stuff and try and try and land stuff, for me, Python's the easiest thing to teach. If you already know C Sharp, then Go nuts, it's baked in, you can just use it. It's just a little toggle switch to say, I would like to use .NET, please. And you can get started and you can start working straight away. So let me know what you think. As always, down in the comments, tell me if you think it's a good idea, why you would use C Sharp, why you wouldn't use C Sharp, and some of the use cases that you see might make sense. All right, hopefully that's useful. I'll catch you next time.